Okay. Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, um, welcome everybody to the uh, Identity Influencers Working Group call. Uh, my name is Tim. I am uh, Shar's kind of co administrator of this group and uh, it's my first time presenting so we'll or not presenting but you know leading it so we'll see how that goes very exciting um first off just wanted to remind everyone that we are operating under the hyperledger antitrust policy so you know don't say anything that you don't want out there uh that's private or you know any of that stuff um so i know I usually lost you tim for a minute or maybe it's just me uh uh, working Mike. for me, working for me, Char. All right. Well, it was it wasn't super important. It was the antitrust. I guess it is super important. Uh, the antitrust policy, Char. So don't say anything. You know, that's private. Um, so, so yeah. I figure without further ado, we can kind of jump right into the uh, working group reports and release plan. Um, so the. Uh, looks like the main identity working group hasn't met recently. Um, there was a Hyperledger Indie Contributors Working Group uh, on the 21st. Did anyone attend that? Yes, um, we talked about moving forward with the release um, of, um, we now have release candidates for Hyperledger Indie uh, for Ubuntu 2004, which is huge. Um, and then working on getting that available for the various um, um, downstream projects, upstream projects, downstream projects um, that use Indie. So we're getting there. <laughs> All right, very cool. Thank you. Um, still have um, a concern with the mixed node issue, but it's not as clear. It's as a serious problem. Mixed node issue is um, a, a, a network that's running 1604 nodes and you introduce a 2004 node to it and there seemed to be early on a, a, a problem with that we've done some upgrades of various things and maybe that solved it but anyway we're still trying to figure out if that's a real problem or not which is annoying because it's intermittent hmm. all right well good to know thank you for sharing um all right moving on the uh, aries working group met on the 29th yesterday um was anyone able to attend that call? Yeah, um, we had some good conversations uh, led by Mr. Curran here, the other one, um, <laughs> about uh, about the um, about proxy ledger access, um, as well as um, the overlay capture architecture as applied to Aries. It was very good, and recordings posted. All right, sounds good. Um, do looks like bifold hasn't met recently uh was anyone able to make the aries agents working group call um akapug we're getting a new release today um 074 will be officially released today the final things came together yesterday um so i'm um, looking forward to having that officially released um and um, we're ready to go. And then we started talking about what will be the final 1.0 1. Uh, 0, 0 release. All right. That's super exciting. Uh, ha had some discussion on DidCom 2 as well. Um, didn't go as far as I, I would have hoped. And, and so we'll see how that goes. I'm looking forward to having some conversations about where that fits, but I think it's still down the line a bit. Was that just uh, no implementation question. questions, Stephen? What's that? Was that just like when to get it in the timeline? Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if there's things that come up that are particularly painful there, like just unknown things, will you raise those back to me? Like it's not clear how you do X and Y at the same time or something? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Steven, was there any highlights for the 0.74 release? Um, the biggest thing, I'm, I'm actually thinking about that for the, the final release notes. I've been doing release notes all along. We've done five release candidates over the over this, and I've had um, sort of release notes put out. But I think the biggest thing is um, uh, uh, a lot of performance work done um, where um, a lot of stability was put in by people both doing 
scale testing, um, load testing, including the creation of a, of a load um, testing um, repository, and then corrections based on what was discovered, and then um, analysis to show how, how um, performant um, the ASCAR implementation is, the, the, the next generation from the Indy SDK, how um, solid that is compared to the Indy SDK. So that's one. Um, endorser work, um, that was a big part of this. You, we now have sort of full Indy endorser capabilities uh, for both an author and a, um, an endorser. And then the third part was a lot of work on revocation and um, some a little bit painful, but not end of the world discoveries on, on handling revocation. And again, all related to sort of productizing and making more robust um, uh, the, the platform. Um, so it, it was really about, um, and, and, and of course, there's a pile of um, other enhancements and a pile of bug fixes related uh, to the product. And it was really a stabilization release, I think, at more than anything. Um, improving its um, use in production scenarios. Great, thanks. All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, next up, we have the Aries Framework JavaScript uh, meeting. Was anyone able to attend this one? Anyone go this morning? It was just an hour ago. <laughs> Um, I know they're making huge process. The, the O2 release is, I believe, out, which um, has a pile of um, AIP2 things in it, and um, including issue credential. And um, they're working on O3 already, which is going to have the present proof V2 in it. So um, moving forward on that. So good progress and, and tons of progress then gets um, carried over into bifold and, and, and that work. All right, very cool. Uh, it looks like these haven't met. I think uh, this trust or repeat all members meeting, was anyone able to go to this? I think that was our most recent, I got June 8th. I, I did attend the um, IAM SSI. It was very interesting, actually. All right. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I'm still trying to digest it myself. Um, <laughs> um, it's an interesting concept um, where the, it's identity access management, I believe is what it stands for. Um, and so it's how we you know, IAM, I, I think of as what we do today to log into to websites and then the SSI and how we have to like migrate from the old world to the new world and use a combination in, in a lot of cases. Um, so it was, it was, there was good concepts talked about. All right. Well, it looks like they do have the recording as well if anybody yeah. wants to, uh, to review that one. Um, oh, just on the governance stack um, working group, there is no meeting today. Um, if anybody was planning on going, there was a note in Slack that um, because Drummond and Scott are both the way, they're going to cancel. So. All right. That's good to know. Um, was anyone able to make this uh, technology stack working group? meeting it looks like a few days ago here on the 27th all right well it looks like you can read their charter and a special presentation if you want to catch up with them um was anyone able to make this ecosystem foundry meeting on the 23rd All right, uh, looks like they were talking about community topics, uh, government across layers uh, is coming up, or governance, sorry. Um, 
Diff Didcom Working Group. It looks like they met on the 27th. Uh, was anyone able to attend this? Yep. Um, we are in a good place from um, um, uh, from the spec perspective. We have received no negative feedback from the, either the technical steering committee or the steering committee. So we anticipate ratification of V2 uh, within a couple weeks. Um, and uh, and then our discussions uh, have centered around extensions, um, how transport extensions are defined uh, for the transports not in the core spec, um, and and stuff like that. So uh, so good ongoing conversation. All right, awesome. Uh, that's all. Of that. I think I saw a recent unsync meeting. Um, was anyone able to go to that? Uh, yeah, both Stephen and I did. Um, there is, um, um, there is a uh, good conversation kind of around the, the direction, how we encourage adoption of, of Didcom V2, um, other stuff like that. So the, ni the nice part about that is the meeting notes are the chat. So you can just go in the group and kind of see what happened. <laughs> and so um, that's, uh, that's convenient, but yeah. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, it looks like the interoperability group also met on the 15th. Uh, that would... Nope, they canceled. Oh, they canceled? <laughs> All right, that's good to know as well. Uh, Sovereign Foundation, nothing. And then W3C. Uh, looks like the community credentials group was meeting a couple days ago on the 28th. Was anyone able to make that one? I mean, the big thing out of W3C is that they've got the um, VC uh, 2.0 working group started. They got their charter and, and started. Did working group is still waiting on... <laughs> on uh, W3C to decide. Okay. Well, uh, I think that is everything, team. Thank you, everyone who shared and uh, went to all these meetings and could bring back that info for us. Um, the next thing on our agenda is a presentation on machine readable governments from uh, Mike Ebert and uh, Simon Nazarenko. I hope I said that right. Um, if one of you guys wants to screen share, let me make sure that you'll be able to. Yeah, looks like you can go ahead and do that. Okie dokie. We're gonna find the right thing. All right, can everybody see some gray slides? Yes. Awesome. All right. So uh, most of the people on this call already kind of know what machine readable governance is, but we have people who will watch the recording and some people who haven't. So uh, we're going to go through some basics, a little bit of code, and um, uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, we'll see if Simon is able to get the demo ready, a little demo to show you today. All right. So I'm going to have to kind of fly through these to fit them in the allotted time. It's, it's kind of a lot of material. So um, please interrupt if I completely blast through a concept that is confusing or if you have a question. So kind of a quick introduction to machine readable governance. We're going to go over what is it, what can you do with it, and then a little bit of a code overview. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done on machine readable governance has been inspired by a uh, proposal RFC by Daniel Hardman. And he said that a governance framework, or is sometimes called a trust framework, is a set of rules that establish trust about processes and indirectly about outcomes in a given context. So if that's what a governance framework is, then machine readable governance would be governance frameworks embodied in formal data structures. So it's possible to react to them with software not just with human intelligence. So we're talking about ways to uh, take the rules and conventions and standards for 
an ecosystem and apply them in machine readable uh, code. Uh, our approach has been to create governance framework files. And uh, these are neat because each particular jurisdiction can publish their own and organize their own ecosystem. And then uh, as ecosystems proliferate, it provides a format that allows them to share uh, without having to um, have centralized servers that you know, decide who is in or who is out of a particular list of trust. So files are cool because they're available to anybody who can resolve the URL or location where they're published. And uh, everyone can look at how things are supposed to um, supposed to go, what the procedures are supposed to be and the rules are ahead of time. Uh, and it allows your, if you have a holder agent that understands a machine readable governance uh, framework file, uh, the agent can use that file to assist the users to make good decisions. Uh, files also support offline interactions. They're relatively easy to cache. And so if you are in service and can download the governance framework file and then store it on your uh, device or agent, then if you end up out of service, uh, some interactions can still proceed and uh, avoids the phone home or uh, call to a centralized location, uh, you know, single point of failure kind of problem as well. One of my favorite benefits to a governance framework file is some of the governance framework files that we've written allow you to decouple your business logic from your code. Uh, part, one of the sections is where, a place where you can specify the actions that, are, that can be taken or that are expected to be taken uh, in your ecosystem. And so uh, if you have the actions and the procedures described there, then you know, those workflows can allow, you know, if an agent can interpret uh, a generic file format that des describes workflows, then you can change your workflow if you need to without having to go into hard-coded agents to change the code that says what they're supposed to do. So uh, the way we've done governance framework files, we have some section, sections that are about establishing the roots of trust. We define some roles and permissions for those roles. And then we've specified some workflows. So we're gonna go over the pieces of code and the file format that describe each of these. Any general questions about governance and machine readable governance frameworks, uh, or governance frameworks and machine readable governance files before we dive into specifics? Um, <clears throat> Mike, just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what's the recommended storage location for machine readable governance files? Um, and one of the thoughts there is, is it with the human readable governance documents? So uh, we're still working on what the recommended way would be, uh, but the there are a couple ways that have been talked about already. The route we took in the interest of getting something working as quickly as we could was to uh, publish the governance framework files on a known domain. So just with a URL and a domain that people kind of trusted already. Uh, you could also use um, uh, publish them in a way such that they have a uh, a did for a did document and use uh, a did web or a did key uh, method of kind of uh, signing and and making sure that those are trustworthy. Um, maybe Sam has some more forward looking comments on good ways to publish these. Um, not many. The the, the point is that they should be published by whatever authority um, is publishing them. So, you know, if you have like an organization website or a company or whatever else, then hosting it on those domains is probably the most sensible place to put it for now. And maybe forever, but at least for now. Yep. Can you be a little more concrete as to what you see as the scope of a, a 
governance framework document? Like, would it be an issuer? Would it be a verifier? Would it be a group of those? Um, it's kind of a, uh, we've written them to kind of live at the ecosystem level. So uh, you have, so for example, um, let's say you have an employer and they uh, are gonna be using verifiable <coughs> credentials internally. And so they, they have uh, a couple different machines that are issuers. Uh, let's say one is for the security group and one is for human resources. And uh, they're going to have uh, a, a number of, uh, maybe a single application or a number of applications that are trusted to be holders. And then they'll have various uh, verifiers that are within their, their little company ecosystem. So you could have verifiers that say, uh, here's the key access code, here's the login system for the servers that we run. Uh, a different one would be, here's how you present that you're an employee so you can collect pay stubs and uh, information about your benefits or something like that. Or uh, another example of an ecosystem is we ran this as a trial with the government of Aruba. And so they had partnered with particular uh, health information providers that uh, they knew would be, um, that they would understand the information coming from them. Uh, and so they made a list of those issuers, uh, even though they didn't control the health systems, they said, we have gone through the process of trusting these particular issuers. Um, here are, here's the government agent that will verify health information and uh, travel information and then issue a trusted traveler, a clearance to enter the country. And then here are known verifiers who are allowed to look at that trusted traveler um, so that you can, uh, at, at several different levels, such as the airport, which would have access to all of the information the government wanted to provide, or uh, a venue like the casino on the island or a hotel or a restaurant um, who would be allowed to see that the government had deemed them healthy and able to travel, but wouldn't have access to most of the information on that credential. So uh, it's kind of a collection of the issuers and the verifiers and the rules they follow for a particular um, collection of uh, entities and services. So uh, maybe a more formal definition there is that it's a it's one or more issuers and zero or more verifiers. You can also have trusted verifiers in the system that are um, issuing credentials that all have this roughly the same semantic meaning. So um, an industry association one is is a decent one. Um, I know you you've got some, some use case going on with lawyers, for example, and so. If you had more than one issuer uh, or one or more issuers that issue credentials relevant to lawyers, then all of those would be trusted issuers for the for the schema, if you if you will. And then um, in, in that alone makes a useful governance file, because now when someone presents you a credential, you actually can decide or use that file to decide whether it's a trusted issuer or not. There's there's two ways Mike is talking about direct listing of issuers. There's, yep. there's another way that we've imagined that, ha that we have not yet put in the file, which is um, the, the, the governance file can say, people are a trusted issuer if they have, can themselves present a credential yeah. uh, from uh, an authority listed here. And that way there's like a, there's like a, a better way of scaling that without listing everyone. Um, that's another way, but we haven't yet had a customer with that thing that hasn't motivated developing it yet. Okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's the scale thing that if I have a more or less generic wallet, how do I know when to pick up a governance file, why to trust it, and, and so on. And I think I agree with, okay, sounds good. I think we know this issue, so it's, it's interesting. Good, thanks. Yeah, well, um, we're exploring the ways to uh, sign a document and so that you can trust the file or where to publish it. Um, and then I think that as uh, an identity community, it would be a good idea to look at, you know, how to tell Mr. Generic Holder that he should pick up a governance file and use it. Um, one interesting thing is that they're still useful, even if the uh, often 
even if the holder doesn't know uh, anything about the ecosystem underneath. But um, yeah, so there's there's all sorts of nuance there. Um, so, and good comments, thank you. Okay, so, uh, so far we have some sample code that would be interesting to describe uh, things about the ecosystem. We're using presentation def definitions as defined by the diff. And then we have a section for actions, which is uh, workflows that are uh, kind of extend what you can do with your establishment of the roots of trust. Okay, so we're using governance files as the glue to hold all of their, our machine readable governance together. And uh, there's a metadata section. This is uh, not a locked down standard by any means. So uh, we've just got some sample ideas here. So uh, you could provide a context, you could name your governance file so, uh, in a human friendly way so people could look at which one is being used, maybe make decisions based on that. Uh, you could version this particular governance file to say we've updated our governance. You could use different formats. So. Uh, we're working with the diff to try and come up with a standard for this. So you could say uh, format one from the diff or format 1.1 or 1.2 or whatever. Um, it would be good to include a unique ID. Uh, it could be a UUID or uh, a DID or something like that. Um, this is not written in stone yet. Uh, this description could go with this human friendly name to say this is what this governance file is for. You could include a last updated date. Um, you could link to uh, resources such as the human readable governance that goes with this machine readable governance. Uh, and then these ideas are, uh, uh, you know, a little more uh, borderline. But you could perhaps uh, tag your document for uh, search and discovery purposes. You could describe uh, the jurisdictions and the ge geographic areas that are uh, involved here. So this is just a, a sample of some ideas there. Um, my sample did not include network of ledger information. You could put that in there. You could provide uh, an, a mediator, an invitation to a mediator, and uh, maybe something about recourse in case one of the agents uh, listed in the framework or in the file doesn't behave the way they're supposed to. Uh, we, we include a list of schemas. So uh, like Sam was saying, you, you have uh, a, a collection of schemas that are semantically related or similar. So in our COVID use case, we had all the things related to um, health and travel uh, for Aruba when they were using, when they needed to check health status. So you have lab orders, results, vaccines, exemptions, and a trusted traveler, which is how the government said, you're good to come to the country. The participants section is the, you know, as Sam was saying, this is the place where you would, if you're hard coding the agents that you trust, if you're hand or, uh, you know, managing a list, um, then that's where you would put these. So uh, the most important part is this did. Um, the other items are optional. We used them to uh, be able to provide some interesting information about the agents without having to stand up uh, additional components in the ecosystem to issue credentials or to provide information about the DIDs. So we just put a little bit in here. Um, the DID would be mandatory. The other sections could be optional. Uh, you know, If they're provided and you understand them and you trust them, go ahead and use them. But if you uh, if they're not provided or they're, they're provided and you uh, don't trust them or you don't understand them, then then use the did to look up something or ignore that. Uh, so in this case, we had, you know, the simplest possible file for Aruba was the government, um, a, a health issuer, and a single venue. Um, we did more than this, but just to kind of illustrate the participant section here, uh, that's kind of what we can, can show there. And then roles uh, can be used to categorize participants in an ecosystem and help others to understand what those participants are supposed to be doing. 
And if necessary, you can assign multiple roles. Uh, this is one of the sections that's most likely to be reworked as we work with the DIFF and other organizations and just you know investigate their needs. But the concepts are pretty similar, uh, no matter what we tweak here. So um, we've uh, listed some roles for this particular use case. Uh, a jurisdiction could describe their own. These could also be, so you could create your own or you could agree on them at a broader scope, say across um, an industry or you know, uh, a government or other jurisdiction. And then you can map those roles to the participants so that you have a notion of permissions. So you could say, we're gonna create uh, a list of health issuers and one of them could be a hospital, one of them could be a lab, or you could say, uh, we're gonna have a list of, um, uh, you know, if you're doing uh, industry standards for, um, you know, certifications, you could say, here are the different providers of training or uh, review boards or things like that, and, and list those. Uh, in the Aruba case, there was a travel issuer. So the government said, we're in charge of issuing travel related credentials. And we're the ones who are going to do the verification in this case. Uh, you could have, you know, as an example, you could have your security verifier and you could have, uh, instead of travel verification, you could have the HR verifier example that I kind of mentioned earlier. And uh, you'll notice the government shows up in two places. That's an example of multiple roles. So that's kind of a permission section. And, um, and Mike, um, yes. just back to that, um, would you consider that um, concept here, the, the role mapping to specific DIDs to be, you know, we've called it a trust registry maybe in the past. Um, it, is that kind of what this would be? This is extremely similar to a trust registry. Um, I have looked into uh, the trust over IP trust registry spec, the version that they just recently published to their GitHub. And the, the, the basic idea of what you're storing, um, the, the ideas are kind of the same, but the, the implementations are a little bit different. So this is included in a file that you can download and parse. And uh, theirs is API centric. They want people to make API calls to their central server uh, to retrieve information about a particular did. Mm -hmm. And so if you were, if you wanted all of the information about who is going to be doing what, then you'd have to query for um, every did. Um, okay. Potentially. So maybe I've got a hole in my understanding there, but so the approach, this is a very similar concept. The approach for delivering it to people is just a little different. Okay, right. Yeah. Um, so once you have the participants and what they're expected to be doing, uh, we've actually done some work to describe what those actions are and then to link them together into, uh, you know, potentially link them in together. You don't have to link them, but you can to link them into workflows. So uh, we took some inspiration from Keith Smith. I like to give him credit. Um, he shared a presentation on interaction documents. And so some of his ideas made it into here. So I just, I like to include that reference for him. Uh, okay, so here is an actions section. that describes the, the workflow in Aruba uh, was a very, you know, it was one of the more complicated ones we've done so far, as far as describing um, all of the different steps and having a number of different things to do. So uh, a quick overview of that sample workflow, you would uh, go and connect to a provider of health information and then uh, prove who you were, then collect your health information, then connect to the government, prove who you were there, um, share your health information, uh, go through a flow to uh, establish that you were, uh, you know, you'd met the other travel requirements, receive a trusted traveler, and then go and get verified at various locations with that trusted traveler to enable you to do different things. And so this, uh, these actions kind of describe what some of those steps are. So this very first one on here is to say, if you're gonna connect to a, connect the holder to a health issuer, 
Um, uh, if you're the health issuer, then you are going to be using an action that is of the type protocol. Uh, there are some other action types as well that we'll talk about in a minute. And then for that action type, you can use, you could say, specify we're using DIGCOM version one, and we're going to start with an invitation. If you have success with this protocol, proceed to uh, the demographic step. And if things, if there's an error, then you could include an error handler. Uh, we've since, uh, in our code, we've actually written the error handling. It's typically a basic message that tells the user what happened. Uh, let's see here. So this is an example of a protocol that's a question answer. So after you connect to the, uh, health issuer, the health issuer is going to ask the holder, have you received a medical release credential from the health lab before? Meaning, um, are you going to authorize us to release your health information? And, you know, you can answer, I need a new credential or I already have one. And then uh, if the protocol executes successfully, then the next step would be to make a decision based on the response from this question. And so, you know, it's, it's uh, information about how to execute this step of, or this action. And then optionally, you can follow uh, the steps that, you know, for success or for errors. And they're all just kind of changed together like that. Um, some other interesting features here. Some of these include, let's see, let's find an example here. Okay, so uh, if you're issuing a credential, you could link to the schema that you're using. And if you're doing a verification, uh, this is where the uh, presentation definitions are linked. And a presentation definition uh, you know, uses the presentation exchange format from the Decentralized Identity Foundation and describes how a presentation is supposed to, to take place. So which, which schema or schemas are supposed to be checked, which attributes are, are being asked for, um, what are some of the formats for those fields. And, um, and what's interesting is you could have multiple actions. Uh, so let's see. So to go back to the um, trusted traveler use case, you could say the, there's a, an action for verifying the full travel document, and that's assigned to roles that are uh, such as the airport or border control who need to see all of the information. And you have a different action for verifying a, basically a simple thumbs up or thumbs down. Do you have one so that uh, the restaurant or the venue would know to let you in, but without exposing any other sensitive information. Um, the other action types besides the you know, ones based on DIDCOM protocols, uh, we've written uh, what's called a decision pro uh, decision action, which allows you to feed in uh, a value and then make a decision based on it. Let's see if I have an example in here. Uh, okay, here we go. So uh, based on choosing which health credential you're going to use to present, uh, you could say if the person chose a lab result, then the next step would be validate the lab result. If they chose a vaccine exemption, then we're going to validate the exemption. Um, so, you know, you could uh, interact with the, the user and then based on their choice, take another action. And then a final action type that we've uh, not actually implemented yet, but have considered would be like an API action where in the, the flow of all of this, you could um, ask your agent to uh, communicate with uh, an external or in another API somewhere, kind of send information or trigger something else that's not uh, perhaps directly related to the agents involved. Um, okay, that's a lot of talking really quick. Uh, are actions, you know, is that starting to describe what these do or is that completely clear as mud? The, the interesting thing for me is this seems to be a, <clears throat> a way to script a controller. So, it, 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 it looks to me like you've got, the, the, the architecture here is you've got a, a ARIES framework, which executes protocols and, and reports back progress and webhooks and so on. 
And, and with that, you have a controller. And then what you've done here is sort of created a script that a controller would use mm -hmm. to manage itself, which is less about governance, I think. I don't know, but that's, and more about um, business process and business flow. And, and so I'm wondering if you have two concepts here that, that don't necessarily have to mix. They don't have to mix, but there's, there's, uh, there's good reasons why governance and process do mix. Okay. And uh, the Keith Smith's example that he always gave was that if you get pulled over by a cop, you, you, you should have the right to verify that they're actually a cop before you present them anything. And so having a process defined in governance says, yes. hey, you're allowed to ask the cop for proof that they're a cop prior to you releasing this information. And then here's the information that the law requires. And so having that kind of interaction there uh, allows for the, um, the, the, the combination of the two. So, so the you're, you're there totally right in that they don't have to be all the time, right? So the vision there would be any wallet would have, would would have this capability of executing actions and they would have a series of actions in the wallet that they could invoke at some point. And that invocation would do a bunch of things that are specified in an action mm -hmm. file, um, but, that, but that the user wouldn't have to carry out each one. Is that kind of what? <clears throat> Yes. Yeah, uh, in the, so far, we've used this mostly on the back end. So, uh, yeah, no, I get that. But, I, 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 but, if, but yeah, I it could be done. Off Sam's example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, okay. You've got hands up. Oh, uh, I'm not seeing the participants. Simon is first. Okay, Simon, go ahead. Um, yeah, just a quick comment to Stephen Curran's uh, question. Uh, so the idea about the governance file uh, is that it's going to be used optionally, and it's going to be you. It's it, there's a possibility to use it only partially. For example, <coughs> if you have an agent that will want to know only about the participants section of the governance file, and then it will just care about knowing the trusted a trusted participant in this ecosystem and don't care about following the action section of the business logic. In the other case, you might, the agent might want to say, hey, I don't really care about the participant section. I can take any credentials from anyone or verify it from you. I don't verify any credential, but I do care about the business flow. Or in the other case, you can say, I would like to have both. Or in the fourth case, you can say, I don't really care about the governance at all, and I will do whatever I want. So the idea is to make it flexible enough to meet every single scenario, whether the, uh, the agent, uh, specific agent, want to follow all, some, or none. And that applies particularly to the holders, where they have the option to do whatever they feel like doing. Uh, it's with uh, when you're trying to establish expectations then uh, if a, an issuer or a verifier goes off the rails and is doing wacky things, then that is uh, sometimes cause for serious concern um, in, in particular uh, workflows or ecosystems. But yeah, so, you know, it's, it's not, shouldn't be mandated for the uh, agents to be able to function as agents, but um, could be problematic if you're doing something sensitive or where you're trying to, to meet a certain expectation. But good comment, Simon. Uh, Kyle. Yeah, um, this is really good. And, and I just wanted to address Stephen Curran's uh, comment that I think this is some governance, that this is some level of governance. Um, maybe it's like ecosystem level um, because it covers off um, some of the requirements that potentially would be there for the transactions between two agents that you want to essentially govern. And, you know, for Sam's example of the, you know, the policeman, you know, that, that ecosystem has that, you know, sort of business process, you know, governed, um, you know, uh, for, you know, the, the person in the car wanting to verify 
first that they are a police officer that you know we can say that that is governed and so that you know business process or transaction you know follows that um, my other comment or question on this is because these are all essentially at, at the end of the day peer-to-peer -peer transactions um, when we talk about this as a controller who is controlling the transaction um, and and what might happen if you know there's different sets of actions uh, on each of the agents uh, that are doing the you know the exchanges uh, so, so far, it's typically driven by uh, whichever agent is the, uh, usually a, the server-based agent right now, um, or, you know, so usually the issuer or the verifier that has a particular workflow they're trying to enforce. Um, if you were to have differences, um, it's possible that you could have you know, if you had one agent using one governance file and a, a different one using a different governance file or a different set of actions, that you could get into some funny uh, edge cases or loops where mm -hmm. uh, one agent responds in a particular way and then throws the other agent, you know, it, it responds and finds itself in a state that it hadn't anticipated or was missing requirements or something like that. Uh, so typically it would be better if they would, uh, you know, we're agreeing on or using the same same governance files so that they could both know that we're we're doing this dance. You know, or one you don't right. want one doing the cha cha and the other doing the waltz, <laughs> right? Um, and so what we need is a, a little music that cues people into uh, which one they're using. Um, but yeah, right now it's typically driven by uh, the agents that would be constrained more constrained to a particular workflow an expectation that your issuer or verifier is going to behave a certain way. And the uh, holders are, uh, the way we've used it so far is to help them understand what's going to happen and what the expectations are so they could flag behavior that's um, inconsistent or problematic. Um, are the actions going beyond just saying initiate this protocol? Because the, once you initiate a protocol, both sides kind of know what the dance is. It's it's the question of who initiates the protocol. I, I I would think that the actions would not contain a lot of detail of of trying to manage the protocol once it's initiated. Right. Or so that part the, of the 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 yeah protocols kind of have their own flow and state machine, right? Right. And absolutely. So these these actions are meant to be uh, at a meta level. So to say, um, we're going to kick off this particular protocol, and then when that protocol uh, is all complete, then um, based on you know the the results of how that interaction went, then we'll look at what the next action should be. So you have kind of a state machine that is on top of or above um, the the state machines that the agents already know how to to run themselves. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, and, and Stephen, some of the, you know, talk about the dance is, you know, even if we just look at this example right here, where you want to verify somebody, like do a verification after an invitation um, is done. Um, if you have both agents, you know, doing that, you know, they will both want to, you know, check who the other person is. How does that work? Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, Mike, Mike, maybe you, you have an answer for if you have two agents both running this thing and they well, so, create an invitation and they both want to verify each other. So the what you could do with with a workflow like this is describe to say, you know what, it generally would be smart if the the issuer or the verifier identified themselves first and then the uh, after they you know those agents had identified themselves, then the holder would present the information that, that, that was needed or, or requested to identify themselves second. Or if it needs to be the other way around, you could list it that way, and then then both agents would know. Okay, when we go through this workflow, I know to expect that the issuer is going to identify itself first, or that the holder is going to request that proof first, and so that they don't end up with the collision of who are you now? Who are you? You know, you first. No, you first. 
in most of those race condition scenarios, there's one party that doesn't care. For example, if, if you are the a DMV or something, you're just going to volunteer your information without caring what you receive first. Um, and the, the only time you really get into the race condition is when you have two typically individuals. And, and, and in that case, what I suspect will evolve as an industry is more of an escalation thing where there's some information you're willing to share all the time. And then, uh, you know, further permission will be required to elevate that. All right. Uh, let's see here. We already covered that it's a state machine. We have some emitters and listeners. So we wrote some custom controller code that could process uh, a governance file. We're working on standardizing the governance files and making the uh, controller code. It's written for Akapai, working on making that um, fully open source so people can look at it and use it. Um, I'm not gonna go over presentation definitions a ton because we can go look at the, this information from the diff and we're rapidly running out of time. Uh, let's see here. All right, we already talked about Okay, some interesting concepts for the future. Uh, we may be able to do some inheritance or copying from one governance file to another, and or, or perhaps just directly referencing sections in other governance files. So for example, uh, you like someone else's trust list, um, but you wanna implement different actions, or uh, you like someone else's actions, but you have your own list of agents. You could kind of put things together that way. Uh, discoverability could be interesting. So once these start getting published, then it might be useful to have ways to find them or search for them or rate them. Um, and then we've talked about, uh, you know, how does an agent know what governance is in use? And so we have to talk about how to surface that, um, you know, where it, so that everybody's aware of what's available. Um, let's provide the link to this presentation in the chat so that everybody can refer to the full uh, governance file sample. There's also a presentation definition sample. And uh, we've done a whole bunch of questions already. Um, Simon, were you able to uh, find one of our demos that's currently up and running at the moment? I know that I asked you at the very last second to prepare that. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> I was able to get my local environment up, so. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing while Simon brings that up, and then Stephen Curran, your hands up. Um, I can wait till after the demo. I don't want to hold that up. Okay. Or, or if it'll take time to get the demo going. No, it looks like it's going good. All right. So Simon's showing us the uh, there's open source code in the Cardia uh, project that includes um, some of the governance. Um, so that is a code base you can go look at and uh, dig through. Uh, we're still working out, you know, it, it's not perfect yet, but um, it's at least in some fashion of usability there. And uh, it's a, a code base that we can share with everybody. So, all right, Simon, so what are you showing us here right now? Right, um, so just, just uh... A quick note that uh, we are at the point where we can actually choose uh, which governments govern government governance file we would like to use. So uh, we have a, a little section in our settings uh, <clears throat> tab which allows us to add a governance uh, file by providing the URL, and then it's going to be available in this drop-down menu, and you can just swap. Um, uh, between the governance in the real time, and it will change the behavior of your agent. So uh, here <clears throat> we're using the uh, atomic actions that we've used for the um, interrupathon. Um, the difference between the um, <clears throat> actions, atomic actions, and the uh, regular governance file is that uh, we are not enforcing the participant. So any role would do. In this case, you can see that we uh, established an active connection, but our holder is uh, just waiting for the next step. And I can just go and uh, send the basic message. And it's going to, uh, this basic message is going to be executed by our governance actions, um, <clears throat> where we just go, uh, we, we send a specific uh, 
flag to the uh, action processor and it's going to go and fetch the governance file and it's going to uh, loop through and see which one uses the uh, basic message protocol and it will uh, grab the message from there in this case it's the this is a basic message in the content of the action and it's going to yep i'm i'm going to interrupt here um so where we if you break down the governance file to any role and the actions aren't linked together into a workflow that ends up being the exact same as a normal agent. Could you uh, potentially switch on the other governance file and show even just two or three steps of the workflow, maybe not the whole thing, but we're pretty much out of time. And um, I could, I did not anchor my did that could cause uh, some. So, uh, I think that we can get as far as, well, uh, you can demonstrate the connection and the question uh, before you. Is, is it going to let you do that? Oh, sure. um, it's not. All right. I uh, mean, if Stephen Curran wants to ask a question, it's going to take me maybe a minute to anchor the did. So it's not going to take too much time. So, um, all right, give it a try. Go quick, and then we'll talk to Stephen for a minute and uh, try and end as soon as as soon as we can. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, just a quick uh, comment, having spent a pile of time in um, um, multilingual and, and overlays capture and, and making that, um, I would highly recommend making sure you've got a mechanism that isolates all the phrases in a governance file so that you can um, make it multilingual. Um, so it's easy for someone to know, okay, here is the full set of things that I've got to translate when I want to have five languages supported in this governance file. So that was the comment I had to make. That's an excellent comment. And after watching your uh, overlay capture architecture presentation yesterday, it's like, oh, I really, okay, it's time to look into it. It's it's uh, ready for you know implementation and I, I should know better. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure overlay is the solution for because your your data structures are so complex. Um, so I'm not sure that's the right one. But but that problem like that. of multilingual absolutely is is fundamental and, and needs to be addressed earlier than better. Absolutely. Ooh, time to take a note. <laughs> All right, where are my notes? There they are. Yeah, I appreciate the feedback. Um, I gave a couple presentations uh, about a year ago, and uh, a lot of people were like, you know, was crickets when I shared any of this. And I don't know what the deal was, but in the last, you know, since this last IIW, I had a lot of good constructive feedback. So it's helping. I just wish I could go faster. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. Hey, I think we're all up and okay. running. Let me. Okay, yeah, uh, there's one step that I keep forgetting every time. So huh, once the change was made, um, our agent will keep the local version of this governance file. And so you, you need to go and fetch that again. And then you can go and decide, right, uh, select that. So <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's a little uh, confusing, but let me get rid of those and boom, we are able to get the invitation so I can scan it. And we got an active connection and boom, here's the question answer that goes through the uh, automated, automated flow. Uh, how far would you like me to go with that, Mike? Uh, another step or two. So um, this doesn't look a, a whole lot different than you know your typical demo, but it's uh, really interesting to note that the actions that are being taken by this enterprise or server-based agent, you know, this controller on top of Akapai, um, those are running through the actions workflow, you know, the kind of the scripted deal to create those. They're not hard coded in our controller code. <clears throat> not paying attention to the values here, so I might, um, did the wrong date there. 
Uh, no, we're fine. <clears throat> All right. So we got a medical release credential offered to us, and we uh, fetched the demographics information from the self-attested and uh, send it back. So there's a medical release knowledge. So if I go ahead and connect again, I should be able to present that. And this shows that decision action in action here where they answered the question and then we went down a different path based on what the user chose. So the first path was we're going to go through a workflow to uh, create your medical release. And then the second workflow was mm -hmm. I've already got one, so we don't need to recreate that process. Um, that's, so that's a pretty right. good uh, demo at the moment, Simon. We're out of time, but it shows that you know, this, the actions were scripted there, showed a little bit about how to load one, a um, little bit about the ecosystem. So thank you very much. Um, I guess we'll turn the time back over to uh, Tim. All right, yes, thank you guys so much uh, for presenting. That was awesome. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. We are unfortunately a few minutes over, so I apologize for that, but um, the recording will be posted and we hope to see you all again in a couple of weeks. Have a good one. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Simon.